What is up, everybody? This is Trent with SoutheastPaper4.com here at Ground Zero in Spartanburg, South Carolina. This time with Matt from Like a Storm. How you doing, man? Good, mate. How are you? How are you guys doing? <laughs> <laughs> so you guys are on this headliner of yours right now. Is this, uh, this is your first time to the States, right? Uh, it's you know it's not our first time to the States, but it's our first time as a as a headliner. Okay, so how's that feel to finally? Uh, Get, get to that point in your career. It's single on the radio and uh, American radio and touring the United States, which is, from what I've heard, like the mecca for foreign bands outside of the United States and stuff. So Yeah, it's uh, it's incredible, man. I mean, we grew up in New Zealand um, listening to American bands, and so yeah, you always yeah. have this dream of like one day <laughs> coming and playing in the States. Yeah. And now we've been fortunate not just to tour in the States as much as we have, but to now to it as a headliner is, okay. is crazy. Okay, so, uh, yeah, you know, um, so how did, uh, New Zealand's like a tiny for, I'm sure everybody knows, but for people who don't, New Zealand's really tiny. It's very so, small, yeah. You know, they got Australia next door and stuff, it's, you know, pretty much bigger, but, you know, still, you're still kind of secluded there, so how in the world did, I guess, a chart-topping rock band <laughs> come from that little island? Like, what's the story with, like, a storm with the name, mean, what does the name mean, and, like, how did you guys uh, get this thing going from such a small country? Um, well, the name comes from uh, a lyric of one of our earlier songs. Okay. And we were looking for a name that hadn't been taken already, which is yeah. almost impossible. <laughs> Anyone who's tried to start a band knows that. You yeah, know? Every yeah. name you can imagine is taken. <laughs> so uh, we thought Like a Storm kind of summed up the sort of band and the sort of music we wanted to make, and no one had taken it yet. So <laughs> that's how we came to be called Like a Storm. As far as how we ended up in America, uh, my brothers and I, we just all grew up playing in different bands and like playing rock music was all we ever wanted to do. Okay. And it got to a point in New Zealand where we realized that, you know, New Zealand's paradise. It's amazing. But it's small and, and as you say, it's quite far away from a lot of the world. So if you want a tour, which is central to being in a rock band, <laughs> then you have to go to where people are. Yeah. And we always had this dream of coming up and playing in America so we moved up to North America not knowing anybody. You know, sometimes okay. we talk to people and they're like, oh, must have been cool to like move up here with a record deal and management. Things we have now, dude, we had none of that. <laughs> yeah. We moved from the other <laughs> side of the world. We didn't know anybody and we just started playing shows and uh, we're very grateful that one thing led to another and, you know, you start playing in front of people who know people and... Um, we just worked our asses off, yeah. and you know, now we're at the point where we, uh, you know, we have a deal here, we have our record out, and it's now our third single on American radio, yeah. which is incredible. Okay. So it's kind of... Um, so you're like, hi, mom, I'm doing well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was just, it's just funny the way that it's worked out, but um, you know, a lot of people have been really good to us. The guys in Creed and Alter Bridge um, really gave us our first tour in America, mm -hmm. and that really kind of kicked the door open as far as um, letting rock fans know about us yeah. and letting other bands know about us. So if it wasn't for those guys, we wouldn't be here. So we okay. owe those guys a tremendous amount. Yeah. Okay, so um, when you guys moved over here, did you guys, I guess, strategically pick a location such as maybe California or Texas or Tennessee where like a lot of the big like music stuff is, or where did you guys uh, relocate when you guys uh, moved here? We actually moved to Canada, first Canada? Okay. Yeah, we moved to Vancouver, um, and we started clubbing there. Vancouver has a, has a good music scene, and we also knew that Vancouver was uh, pretty closely tied to like LA and Seattle, mm -hmm. you know, those West Coast yeah, places. Yeah. And so it was really on the West Coast that we started to make a name for ourselves. So we would play in Vancouver, we um, met a lot of people who had connections in Los Angeles, and actually we ended up... Uh, basically relocating to LA and making our first record there. Okay. So the record that we have out now, which is the one that most people know us for, Awaken the Fire, is actually our second album. Yeah. And the first album we had called The End of the Beginning, we made in Los Angeles. And it was during the time that we spent there that we met a lot of the people who have really made the rest of our career possible. Okay. That's awesome. Yeah. So, um... Uh the record's out now, and so it's a new, brand new one out this year. So uh, what can you tell us about the name? What does the name mean? And uh, um, well, after you talk about that, I'll touch on a few songs I actually uh, enjoyed on there to get more into. So uh, sure. what's, what's, the whole, uh, what's the whole theme with the record, and what's the name mean? Well, so the record's called Awaken the Fire, and it's actually a, it's a lyric from the first song on the album, which is a song called Chaos. Mm -hmm. And we were trying to come up for a name that we th with a name that we thought kind of summed up the album, 
And when we went back and revisited those songs, you know, the music we write is incredibly personal to us. And we look back at the collection of songs and the themes behind them, and we realized that the album was really about defiance and uh, following your dreams and, you know, having passion. So we thought Awaken the Fire was the perfect uh, title to sort of encapsulate what the record was about. Yeah. You know, it wasn't like we set out to make a concept album or anything, but when we looked back at it, it's like, you know what? All these songs have the same uh, underlying theme. Yeah. So that's how it came to Was the goal to hit the radio with those songs, or were you guys just writing whatever you guys were feeling? It's it's been the craziest (laughs) thing, you know? It's, I mean, there's always a part of you as a songwriter that dreams that maybe these songs you're writing will get out to the masses, and, and obviously radio is a huge thing for that. But... A lot of those songs we wrote, uh, most of the songs we wrote when we were completely independent, before we had our record deal, before we had our management, we just literally made whatever music we yeah. wanted to hear. Yeah. And it's kind of cool that it's worked out that the music we made when we were totally separated from the music industry, doing whatever we wanted, that's now the music that we're known for. Yeah. So it's kind of cool that you know, the most true representation of us as a band is what people are hearing. Okay. So one of the songs that sticks out to me um, is uh, Love the Way You Hate Me. Yeah. I, I love that one. So uh, it's, it's got a little bit of a metal core, you know, breakdown in it, and yeah. it, as well as, you know, the catchy hook, you know, that, you know, Radio Rock's known for, the, the hook set, as well as the heaviness, as well as, uh, I've been asking him how to say the instrument all night, did you boo or did you boot or did <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Something it's, like it's, that. Uh, it's didgeridoo. Didgeridoo. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so how did, what made you guys want to, I guess, throw like a native, I guess you could say it's a native instrument, you know, from your country into this, into, into like a rock type song, you know, and, uh, what, what, like, what was the thought process behind that? Um, well, it's an Australian instrument, so it's, uh, it's not from New Zealand, but we spent a lot of time in, in Australia growing up. Our grandparents used to live there, so we would go to Australia every year. Okay. And, um, we just always thought it was like, you know, such an amazing sounding instrument. It's so hypnotic, you know? Chris taught himself how to play it after a trip to Australia, <laughs> and it's a notoriously hard instrument to learn. You have to be able to circular breathe, which is how you keep the drone going even while you're breathing in, um, and also to make all the different sounds. Chris taught himself how to play it in three days. Somehow, I don't know how the hell he did it. <laughs> and, uh, and then as soon as he could play it, we just thought it was like the coolest sound on earth. Yeah. And so it wasn't like we just thought, oh, you know what's going to make us different? We're going to have didgeridoo. (laughs) It was actually just that we thought it was such a cool instrument that we wanted to try and put that in our music. And it gives the album a different sound. You know, you have the hard rock, you have the metal sound, the heavy parts, but that kind of does add another element to the sound. It has like another, adds a little different atmosphere to it. It it has like a little, I guess, exotic type feel to it. Yeah, it has a very like primal sound. And I think that's part of the reason that really drew us to the didgeridoo is that it just, the sound of it is just like, nothing you've ever heard before what we didn't think about is how good it would sound when we put it with heavy guitars and drums (laughs) and love the way you hate me is the first time we've done that so the didgeridoo had been part of our sound previously and chris would play it live um but what we'd never done is have a heavy song and put the didgeridoo as part of the music the way that you would like a second guitar yeah and when we stumbled across that and Love the Way You Hate Me, that was the first time we were like, wow, <laughs> there's something here that we've never heard before. Yeah. But it wasn't like we woke up one day and just decided to do it. It was just a process of, um, you know, creating music with different elements. And that was one of the things that came yeah. about. So uh, I guess for a live show, not necessarily on the album, is there a didgeridoo solo? You know, people do drum solos, guitar solos. Is there a didgeridoo? We actually, <laughs> we have a didgeridoo and drum solo. Okay. And uh, actually, and then I play uh, drums as well. So there's like two drummers and didgeridoo. That's pretty. That's pretty insane. That's kind of reminds me of a uh, nothing more with their whole bass rig. Everybody yeah. playing the basses and get the drums and stuff. So uh, I think that's one of the cool things about getting to headline. Um, we've we used to do a didge and like dueling drum solo when we first started playing in North America. And then when you're touring, uh, opening for other bands, you have a much shorter set. Yeah. And so you just don't have the same amount of time. Yeah. But now that it's out tour, we can be a bit more <laughs> indulgent. So, okay. Yeah, it's been so, cool. So uh, some of the who are the, some of the uh, bands you guys grew up listening to? I know like you know Australia's right there, so you know you have like 
Parkway Drive, who's like huge metal band. You know, you got some other bands coming about of Australia that are pretty heavy like that, as well as, you know, a lot of the American heavyweights, you know, like Breaking Benjamin and stuff. So who are some, I guess, uh, I guess bands that influenced you guys, you know, in New Zealand? Um, I mean, for us, I guess, you know, we grew up listening to a lot of different music. And our parents were big fans of, like, the Beatles and Creedence Clearwater Revival and the Eagles. So when we were younger, that was what we listened to. When we got a bit older and started to get into rock and roll uh, and metal, you know, for me it was, like, Korn, Deftones, Tool, Metallica. Um, and then, you know, we loved, like, Nirvana and Alice in Chains yeah. as well. Um, and we also really got into industrial, like Nine Inch Nails okay. and, and then, you know, Marilyn Manson, which is kind of industrial metal. Um, so I think the music that we write is a combination of those things that we grew up listening to. We've always loved like great songwriting, you know, like you look at the Beatles or the Eagles or Credence, you know, it's like, those are just great songs. Even years later, oh, you're yeah, still like, sure. what a great song. But we also loved heavy music as well. I think that's how we ended up wanting to write like heavy songs that had choruses that people would walk away singing. Yeah. So, uh, you guys uh, love heavy music and everything, but you guys obviously have a soft spot for some hip-hop, because you guys did a cover of Gangsta's <laughs> <laughs> Paradise on there, too. So, yeah, what made did. you guys just, like, uh, you talk about the songs being all personal and stuff, so what made you guys just decide to throw out a Gangsta's Paradise cover right well, natu here, Naturally, we're gangsters, you know, everybody <laughs> knows that. <laughs> um, that was kind of cool, you know. Uh, we grew up listening to a lot of different music, and we did grow up listening to hip-hop as yeah. well as, I mean, anything we could find. Uh, Gangster's Paradise had always been a song that we thought was cool when we were kids. You know, yeah. just musically, lyrically, it's like, it's. I mean, to me, that's a work of art. That song. Yeah. And when we were writing "Awake in the Fire," we, Chris and I, went out one night just to get a break from the studio, and uh, "Gangster's Paradise" came on. And I guess without realizing, we were still in the headspace of making an album. You know, so every time you hear a song subconsciously you're kind of analyzing it or dissecting it or whatever yeah. because you're in that mindset. We both just started talking about <laughs> how awesome it would be if a band did a heavy version of that. Yeah. And then we're like, you know what, man, we're in the middle of making this album. We have our own studio, so let's just try it and see what we think. And uh, we went home that night and started working on it. And it became this like midnight to 6 a.m., like top secret experiment. <laughs> we didn't even tell our brother Kent about it for like a week because we thought, you know, we want to see if this is any good before we show anybody. Um, and by the end of the record, it just it came together sounding so cool that we thought we just had yeah. to put it on the album. Yeah, that's really awesome. <laughs> so you refer to your band members as brothers. Is, are they literally your brothers, or are they are y'all brothers, or y'all or you just refer to them as your brothers? Well, two, three of three out of the four of us are literally brothers. Oh, that's cool. Uh, we all have yeah. the same last name and everything. Never, never get tired of. Seeing each other every day, and you know, we actually we get on really well. We always have done. Um, I mean, you have fights, but you have fights with you. You go on tour with another human being eleven months a year. Something's going to happen. Yeah. Right? The great thing about being family is that you're not afraid to say what's on your mind. So things just, you know, you just work through problems. You don't build yeah. up these weird resentments or. Um, you know, if someone says, you're always going to say what's on your mind to your brother. Yeah. And then it's over. Yeah. So, I mean, they're great musicians and, uh, you know, I would, even if they weren't my brothers, just being the people they are, those are the guys I'd want to be in a band with. Okay. Um, it's just cool that we're also family. Yeah. <laughs> and then Zach, our drummer, is like our other brother. You know, we've known him for years and uh, and we just have a great chemistry with him as well. So, okay. That's cool. Yeah. So, um. Give us some, uh, I guess, inside scoops on New Zealand culture versus American culture. Like, what are what are some uh, culture shocks you've seen here? That when you first got over here, you're like, like I've heard, um, I forgot which band it was, but uh, we, uh, they told us they walked into Walmart and they saw guns sitting there. Like, you could just go up and buy a gun at Walmart, and that really like blew the lid off of them for them. So, like, what are some, I guess, uh, things like that or similar that you know you guys got over here and you're like, you can do this here, or they sell this here, or yeah, I mean, I got to say, you know. Guns is a big one. <laughs> uh, New Zealand has very tight gun control laws. Yeah. You know? um, f I mean, for example, to even own a handgun in New Zealand, it would be like trying to own like an automatic weapon here. Hmm. They have to go in a safe. You have to have... I had a friend growing up whose dad had guns. 
And uh, I mean, in New Zealand, you know, hunting's popular, so people do have rifles or oh, yeah, shotguns yeah. for that. But as far as anything more than that, it's incredibly difficult to have. Um, I guess I don't know. I mean, America's just. Uh, I mean, we weren't shocked because we grew up being really exposed to America. You know, the thing about New Zealand, which is kind of cool, is that they sort of half of your pop culture comes from America and the other half comes from England. Mm -hmm. So we grew up listening to American bands, watching American movies, and we also grew up listening to English bands and watching okay. English movies. So, you know, it wasn't so much of a culture shock as if we'd come from like Nairobi or something. Yeah. But um, certainly it is, it is different, you know. Um, like I think the, Like the food and everything, fast food and... <laughs> well, fast food is a bit more prevalent here. Yeah, and when you first start touring, you're like, oh, this is awesome, we can go to McDonald's every day. I can spend a dollar and get this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then, uh, and then obviously after a year or so of that, you're like, you know what, I feel terrible, I've got to <laughs> stop eating McDonald's every day. <laughs> but um, I think one of the things that really struck us and still does is just how big America is. Mm -hmm. How big it is and the number of different cultures in it. You know, yeah. you come to the South, you go to Texas, you go to the Northwest, the Midwest. It's like being in different countries, you know? Okay. So I think uh, New Zealand is much more compact, so you don't have the same range you have here oh, where yeah, it's sure. like 12 different countries in one yeah. place. Okay. Say a couple more fun ones and we can close it out here real quick. Uh, if Taylor Swift could write a song about you personally, if you got to hang out with her, marry or date or whatever, <laughs> and she wrote a song about you, what would it be called and what would it be about? I think that would have a lot to do with what we did. <laughs> <laughs> what would that be? <laughs> well, I don't know. She's, you know, I have a girlfriend and she seems like a lovely girl. Um, I don't know. That's a hell of a question. I think she'd have a hard time understanding me in the first place. Okay. So I don't know how we're, much we're material quick, she'd Real quick, um, America, we're in the South, so do your quick Southern accent real quick. Uh, y'all ain't from around here. <laughs> that's pretty good. Thanks. I don't know if that's like necessarily southern, uh, but it's, it's like it's, it's covers it's most American. of the south. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. It covers most of the south. You boys ain't from around here. Yeah, so. exactly. <laughs> All right, and our last one. What is an interesting or unique fan interaction you've had? Uh, I think one of the funniest is when uh, a guy came up to us and he was like, uh, "My five-year-old really wants you to sign his head." <laughs> and it's like I've never we've signed a lot of different things I've never signed anyone's head before and there was just something so ridiculous and funny about this little kid this cute little kid looking up at you <laughs> while you sign his head and you go to his dad like are you sure this is what he wants feels wrong but that was what he wanted okay. so that's always stuck out to me because it's just like you sign a lot of stuff but uh a little kid's forehead, I can honestly say. Yeah. I never thought I'd sign one of those. <laughs> All right, is there anything else you want to say before we wrap it up here? Or yeah, like promote thanks or anything? to everybody for checking us out. Um, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter and, uh, you know, likeastorm.com is our website. And a big shout out to our fans. Thank you guys so much. We literally wouldn't be here without you. So okay, thank you. awesome. This is Trent with Sally Spitport. We're hanging out with Matt from uh, Like a Storm. Thanks for watching, guys.